Hello guys, a warm welcome to all of you. Here we are for the discussion of INICET November 22 Physiology Questions. In this recently concluded exam, majority of the questions in physiology are coming from very well known areas. Except one or two new questions, we will discuss about that. I always say guys, exam does not end in the exam hall. The post exam analysis is very important. You have to sit and think where you went right, where you went wrong. If you answer the question correctly, appreciate yourself. The self appreciation is very, very, very important. On the other hand, if you did anything wrong, don't criticize yourself much. What I'm trying to say is appreciate yourself, but don't criticize much yourself. This appreciating yourself, self appreciation is very, very important. It does wonders to you. Just try it. It is going to do whole lot of wonders to you. So we are here for the post exam analysis of this physiology questions. We'll start the discussion now. First question, a very important question, which is one of the most common repeat areas. You should never make a mistake in this areas. Ventricular action potential. Ventricular action potential sequence order they have asked. And some channels when they when they open, when they close, they asked you. Any guess? The options are in front of you. Any guess, guys? What is the answer? Very important question. To understand this, look into the diagram first. This ventricular action potential has got five important phases. Zero, one, two, three, four. So zero, one. 2, 3, 4. Total, there are 5 important phases. What are the name given to this phases, sir? So, guys, this phase 0 is early depolarization. We all know depolarization is always because of sodium ions coming inside. Sodium influx, this is phase 0, early depolarization, which is followed obviously by repolarization. This phase 1 is called as early repolarization for an important reason I will tell you. Repolarization is always because of potassium ions moving out. Then we have a classical phase you exclusively see only in the ventricular action potential. We call that as a plateau phase. Here this potassium ions are still moving outside to balance that calcium ions are coming inside. This is positive, this is positive. Moving out of one is balanced by incoming another positively charged ion. So the membrane potential stays same. That is why we call this as plateau. Potassium moving out, calcium coming inside. This calcium coming inside is exclusively because of long lasting calcium channels. At one particular point, this long lasting calcium channel eventually closes. So the only ion that can still move out is potassium. This is called as late repolarization. Why we are differentiating this? Early repolarization, late repolarization because of a plateau phase in between. So at the end of repolarization, it will come back to its original resting membrane potential that is minus 90 millivolt. So reaching its resting membrane potential, which is because very simple logic. Sodium ions are inside, potassium ions are outside now. It is not a normal state for any cell. You have to throw this sodium ions out and you have to move in this potassium ions. With the help of this important channel protein that is going to be active during this phase 4 which is our sodium potassium ATPase. It is this sodium potassium ATPase which is going to maintain the normal state back again following action potential. What is that normal state? Sodiums are thrown out, potassium is bringing back inside. This is the normal state. Sodium is extracellular, potassium is intracellular. So for this, this phase 4, sodium potassium pump will be active. So early depolarization, sodium influx. Early repolarization, potassium efflux. Then we have plateau. Potassium moving out is balanced by calcium coming inside. Then we have late repolarization, which is because of potassium moving out. Finally, reaching resting membrane potential with the help of 
sodium potassium ATPase. Now let's go into the options. We are clearly seeing most important first opening of voltage gated sodium channels, yes. Followed by transient outflow of potassium, yes. Then opening of calcium channels, yes. Then finally repolarizing potassium current. So the order should be A, B, C, D. Where is the option? A, B, C, D. So it is option B here, the correct answer. Remember this ventricular action potential, its phases, very, very important concept. Now with this idea, let's move into the next question. The below graph shows oxygen dissociation curve. The curve marked as A indicates. Where it is marked A, here it is marked A. Now you have to understand, what is this classical curve? Any guess? Any idea? The answer for the question, this graph, this curve corresponds to myoglobin. Why sir? Let's have a discussion. The answer is D here, myoglobin. To understand this, remember, two important oxygen carrying proteins. First one is myoglobin. The second one is hemoglobin. What we know about hemoglobin? We all know one hemoglobin can bind four oxygen. So the ratio is 1 is to 4. Look very carefully. This starting point. There is always a tight hemoglobin. We call T hemoglobin. First oxygen comes. It is going to bind very, very, very difficult. This first binding is very difficult. After this difficulty, after so much of difficulty, it is converting this T hemoglobin into relaxed hemoglobin. Now it is no longer tight. It is relaxed. Second, third, fourth. They all, these three can now bind easily. So the first oxygen binding very, very, very difficult. But after this difficulty, it is converted to our hemoglobin. So the remaining three oxygen can now bind easily. We call this concept as theory of cooperativity. So this first oxygen is helping cooperating the binding of remaining three oxygen. It is this cooperativity responsible for the normal sigmoid shape of oxygen dissociation curve for hemoglobin. Now what about this myoglobin sir? The classical difference here one myoglobin can bind only one oxygen. So there is no need for cooperativity here. Correct, sir. For hemoglobin, you need cooperativity. For myoglobin, there is no need for cooperativity. That is why the curve, oxygen dissociation curve exclusively for myoglobin. Remember, guys, it is called as rectangular hyperbola. Take home message. Oxygen dissociation curve for hemoglobin is sigmoid shaped, but for myoglobin, it is a rectangular hyperbola. It is not sigmoid because there is no cooperativity. This myoglobin is exclusively abundant in muscles. It is abundant in muscles. Very, very, very important for exercise. For example, the classical group of muscles, calf muscles, will have more amount of myoglobin. Why, sir? Most important point, this myoglobin serves as an oxygen storage reservoir that helps tremendously during exercise in muscles. Very important. Myoglobin is exclusively abundant in muscles, particularly very much helpful for exercise. For example, calf muscles. It is considered to be an oxygen storage reservoir found in muscles that helps during exercise. These are the important concepts. What are we going to understand here now? Let's go into the diagram now. What is this A is for? Myoglobin. What is this curve called as? Rectangular hyperbola. This is the sigmoid shape we have for hemoglobin. Remember, we have left shift and right shift here. That is oxygen dissociation curve for hemoglobin. That is sigmoid shape. But here we are discussing about myoglobin, muscles, 
rectangular hyperbola. Most important point, it is looking like a left shift. True. It is extremely left shifted. That means what? Most important concept. Now look into this sigmoid shaped graph at a partial pressure of 20. At a partial pressure of 20, we are seeing the oxygen content is usually around 25. The same partial pressure of 20, now look into our myoglobin, here is the answer, it is still 90% saturated. For hemoglobin, if the oxygen partial pressure is 20, the oxygen saturation is only 25. But for myoglobin, for the same partial pressure, it is still highly saturated around 90%. It is for this reason, myoglobin can serve as an oxygen storage reservoir. Such low partial pressure of oxygen you see in muscle exclusively during exercise. Exercise utilizes lot of oxygen. The partial pressure gets lowered in exercising muscle. Such low partial pressure. This myoglobin serves as an oxygen storage reservoir that can give this oxygen to the exercising muscle. Hemoglobin is not suited for this purpose. Why? Why hemoglobin is not inside a muscle? The answer is simple. At such low partial pressures, the saturation is only 25% for hemoglobin. But what about myoglobin? It is very high, 90% saturation. That means it can store lot of oxygen when needed at such low partial pressures in muscle. It can give those oxygen. It is for this reason, myoglobin, storage reservoir for oxygen in muscles. It is having a rectangular hyperbola. This is myoglobin. So the answer A curve is for myoglobin, rectangular hyperbola. A very important discussion we had. Please to follow this discussion. This question can surely repeat again. Next. How do you calculate cerebral perfusion pressure? C, P, P. A very, very, very practical question. Especially in the ICU setup. Any guess, any idea? It is the difference of mean arterial pressure minus intracranial pressure. We are going to have a very important discussion now. The answer is A. Look carefully, guys. Cerebral perfusion pressure equals mean arterial pressure minus intracranial pressure. This is mathematics. We are not interested in this mathematics formulas. What is the concept here, guys? Very, very simple. Brain, you need blood supply. Remember, guys, we always know Newton's law. For every action, there is equal and opposite reaction. For every action, there is equal and opposite reaction. What is the action here, sir? We are concerned. The action is to send blood to the brain. For this, you need mean arterial pressure. It is the driving force. It is the action which is going to send blood to our brain. On the other hand, it is going to get opposed. This opposing factor is the intracranial pressure. This intracranial pressure is the opposing factor. If it is becoming more, intracranial pressure becoming more means the blood vessels are compressed. Blood cannot flow inside. So action, equal and opposite reaction. The action is the mean arterial pressure. The reaction, opposing reaction is the intracranial pressure. Their difference is going to govern the cerebral perfusion pressure. Look very carefully. Normally, the mean arterial pressure is around 90 millimeters of mercury. The intracranial pressure is usually around 10 millimeters of mercury. How much is the difference? 80 millimeters of mercury. Practical point. The normal cerebral perfusion pressure we are interested is usually around 60 to 80 millimeters of mercury. 90 minus 10, 80. The normal range we are interested is 60 to 80 millimeters of mercury. Now, we know about the driving force, the action, mean arterial pressure. This intracranial pressure, why it is opposing, sir, many of you may not be able to understand. Let me tell you very simply, guys. Inside the 
skull. We have, remember, brain tissue. We have the blood supply. We have the cerebrospinal fluid. At any one point of time, their volume, remember, their volume is always constant. What is this principle called as? Munro Kelly Doctrine. What is the meaning of Munro Kelly Doctrine? At any one point of time, brain, blood, CSF, their volume should be constant. If any one of this is rising, it is definitely going to compress the blood flow. It is definitely going to compress the brain tissue. Simple. For example, hydrocephalus. Whenever there is rise in CSF pressure, the blood flow will be compromised. Brain tissue will be compressed. Because of which important law? Munro Kelly doctrine. It is this CSF pressure which is going to determine the intracranial pressure. CSF pressure rises, intracranial pressure rises. That means this blood vessel will be obstructed, no blood flow. So guys, whenever the intracranial pressure rises, according to Munro Kelly doctrine, definitely blood vessels will be obstructed. There is no blood flow. Simple. Remember Newton's law. For every action, there is equal and opposite reaction. The action here is the mean arterial pressure. The opposing factor is the intracranial pressure. Their difference is cerebral perfusion pressure. Normally, we have to maintain this at 60 to 80 millimeters of mercury. Mainly, this is needed. Maintenance of this pressure in this range is needed to prevent exclusively important point ischemic brain injury. If the cerebral perfusion pressure decreases, brain perfusion decreases, ischemia, this ischemia is notorious to cause lot of deleterious effects in brain. So to prevent ischemic brain injury, you need to maintain the cerebral perfusion pressure in the range of 60 to 80 millimeters of mercury. This is the formula they asked here. Cerebral perfusion pressure equals mean arterial pressure minus intracranial pressure. With this understanding, let's move into the next question. Evergreen, very, 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 very chronic repeat MCQ topic. They will always ask one question from this area. Respiratory physiology. Remember guys, what does the zero pressure indicate in the pressure volume curve? Simplest question asked numerous times before. The answer is functional residual capacity. Remember, what is that exact diagram you need to understand? It is the compliance of lung, chest wall and the combined lung and chest wall. In this graph, remember guys, PL is the compliance of lung. PW is the compliance of chest wall, wall, W. And PTR is the total compliance, which is the combination of lungs plus chest wall. Remember guys, very important. There are two major forces here. First one is the chest wall. Second one is the lung. This chest wall always have a tendency to move outward. Lung always have a tendency to collapse or to move inward. This chest wall trying to move out. This lung is trying to collapse inside. There are two forces, again equal but opposite here. Chest wall, the normal tendency is to move outward. Lung spring, lung spring. The normal tendency of lung is to collapse inward. There are two equal and opposite forces. Both of them come to equilibrium. This two equal and opposite forces come to equilibrium at a particular volume, equilibrium volume. This equilibrium volume is functional residual capacity, which is usually around 2.5 liters. Now look into this important graph. There is one particular equilibrium point where both these two important forces come to equilibrium exactly at zero pressure. This is the question. 
what is this volume sir functional residual capacity which is usually around 2.5 liters you can see in this graph it is usually around 2.5 liters most important concept so the zero pressure corresponds to functional residual capacity which is actually the equilibrium point what is the meaning of this equilibrium point sir chest wall trying to move out lung trying to collapse they'll come to equilibrium at one point that point is equilibrium volume so the zero pressure corresponds to this equilibrium point functional residual capacity that is 2.5 liters now let's go into the question what does the zero pressure indicate in the pressure volume curve we have discussed now functional residual capacity which is usually around 2.5 liters now very important next question fluid leaving the pct in the absence of adhs always isotonic what is the meaning of this concept sir very simple nephron segments pct loop of henle distal convoluted tubule collecting duct this pct always remember it reabsorbs equal amounts of sodium and water 70 percentage very important irrespective of presence or absence of adh it always reabsorbs 70 percentage of sodium and water this is called as remember guys obligatory water reabsorption irrespective of presence or absence of adh it doesn't matter it doesn't matter at all adh level doesn't matter at all here irrespective of presence or absence of adh pct always reabsorbs equal amount of sodium and water the osmolarity will not change here tonicity will not change here that is why the nature of the fluid here is always isotonic pct the nature of the fluid is isotonic because it reabsorbs equal amount of sodium and water they are very good couple sodium and water they always move together very 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 faithful couples wherever they go they go together but not at loop of henley he is the enemy he is the villain this beautiful couples are going to separate now they are going to function like singles that is why this effect is called single effect what is the meaning of single effect this beautiful couples are splitted now they become single why we have descending loop of henley and ascending loop of henley this descending loop of henley is permeable to water but impermeable to solutes like sodium and chloride so water moves out sodium chloride inside the inside becomes concentrated thereby the fluid becomes hypertonic in pct it is isotonic this isotonic fluid coming to loop of henley descending loop of henley making it hypertonic on the other hand ascending loop of henley is totally impermeable to water ascending loop of henley impermeable to water so always the water stays inside it becomes diluted thereby becoming hypotonic pct isotonic descending loop of henley hypertonic ascending loop of henley hypotonic why is this happening because loop of henley is the villain it separated our couples they become single now single effect now it is this hypotonic fluid that is going to dct so the dct nature of fluid is always hypotonic it is this hypotonic fluid coming to collecting duct in the presence of adh positive water will be reabsorbed so automatically the fluid can become hypertonic in the presence of adh on the other hand if adh is absent water will not be reabsorbed it will become hypotonic so depend upon the presence or absence of adh here collecting duct can have either hypertonic or hypotonic fluid simple take home message pct it is isotonic 
లూప్ ఆఫ్ హెండ్లీ డిసెండింగ్ లూప్ హైపర్టోనిక్ అసెండింగ్ లూప్ హైపోటోనిక్ దిస్ హైపోటోనిక్ ఫ్లూయిడ్ ఇస్ కమింగ్ టు డిస్టల్ టిబ్యూల్ దర్ ఇస్ హైపోటోనిక్ ట్రూ దిస్ హైపోటోనిక్ ఫ్లూయిడ్ కమింగ్ టు కలెక్టింగ్ డక్ట్ ఇఫ్ దర్ ఇస్ ఏడీ హెచ్ ప్రసెంట్ వాటర్ విల్ బీ రీఅబ్సార్బ్డ్ హైపర్టోనిక్ ఇఫ్ ఏడీ హెచ్ ఇస్ యాబ్సెంట్ వాటర్ ఇస్ నాట్ రీఅబ్సార్బ్డ్ హైపోటోనిక్ దట్ ఈస్ వై ఏడీ హెచ్ ఇస్ ఇంపార్టెంట్ హియర్ దిస్ టైప్ ఆఫ్ వాటర్ రీఅబ్సార్బ్షన్ ఇస్ కాల్డ్ అస్ ఫ్యాకల్టేటివ్ వాటర్ రీఅబ్సార్బ్షన్ In PCT, we have obligatory water reabsorption, no role of ADH. In collecting duct, there is a role of ADH for water reabsorption. We call this as facultative water reabsorption. So, with this idea, let's look into the question. Fluid leaving the PCT, irrespective of presence or absence of ADH, it is always isotonic. Very important discussion we had. Alright guys, now let's look into this question, which is the exact repeat. from the recently concluded previous INICT exam. Repeat question. Match the following molecules with their carriers in plasma. We have pre-albumin. This pre-albumin is also called as, remember guys, trans-thyretin. I usually write it like this to easily remember. Trans-thyretin. Thy means it is going to bind thyroid hormone. Retin means it can also bind and transport vitamin a pre albumin is also called a trans thyretin for thyroid hormones and vitamin a so thyroxine one is a albumin is important for fatty acids b haptoglobin can bind hemoglobin heme hemopexin is going to bind and transport heme So, fourth is D. So, guys, pre-albumin also called trans-thyretin for thyroxine, albumin fatty acid, haptoglobin for hemoglobin and hemopexin for heme. This is the repeat question. So, we are matching the molecules with their carriers in plasma. Simple. Another very, very high yield MCQ question, guys. Which among the following organs have least arteriovenous oxygen difference? Any idea? Any guess? A very important table is coming. But before that, understand. Artery is where blood is in. That means oxygen is in to a tissue. Vein. This blood moves out of the tissue. So automatically, oxygen will move out. Blood comes in, blood goes out. Oxygen comes in, oxygen goes out. How much is the oxygen utilization by the tissue? How to find out that? Oxygen utilization is based on the principle of this oxygen extraction. How to find out this oxygen extraction? Some amount of oxygen is coming inside. Following utilization by the tissue, the remaining oxygen moves out. Correct? So, this arterio venous oxygen difference is what is our oxygen extraction very simple the difference is actually extracted and utilized by the tissue so this arteriovenous oxygen difference talks about oxygen utilization oxygen extraction which important organ the answer for this question least arteriovenous oxygen difference is kidney to understand this a very important table i told you guys whole lot of numbers are there but i highlighted which are all the ones very very important surely mcq question distribution of cardiac output we have 5 liters of cardiac output which you are going to distribute based upon the organ and its requirement remember very important mcq if you express the cardiac output for the whole organ maximum percentage of cardiac output goes to liver 1500 ml that corresponds to 27.8 percentage of cardiac output for the whole organ maximum cardiac output goes to liver but if you express the cardiac output per 100 gram per minute kidney dominates whole organ liver per 100 gram per minute it is kidneys 
420 ml per 100 gram per minute. This is expressing the cardiac output per 100 gram. Now the question which is asked here in INICT, arteriovenous oxygen difference which means oxygen extraction, which means oxygen utilization. Maximum if they ask you, arteriovenous oxygen difference, remember heart. Least if they ask you, that is the answer for our question, kidneys. Oxygen extraction, high oxygen demand is always there for heart. Least arteriovenous oxygen difference is for kidneys. Next coming to oxygen consumption, for whole organ, definitely it is going to be liver. That is why summarizing, for whole organ, maximum cardiac output liver, maximum oxygen consumption liver. On the other hand, look very carefully, the same oxygen consumption, if you express per 100 gram per minute, remember it is our heart. We can remember 10 ml per 100 gram per minute for heart. This oxygen consumption expressed per 100 gram per minute. So the most important point, maximum cardiac output whole organ goes to liver. Maximum cardiac output per 100 gram per minute goes to kidneys. Arteriovenous oxygen difference maximum for heart, minimum for kidneys. Oxygen consumption for the whole organ, maximum for liver. Oxygen consumption per 100 gram per minute, heart dominates. That is 10 ml per 100 gram per minute. If you express the oxygen consumption per 100 gram per minute. So what is the question asked here? Least arteriovenous oxygen difference is always for our kidneys. Maximum arteriovenous oxygen difference is for heart. Such an important table. Pause here. Pause this video. Look into this important table and take all the points, whatever I said. It should not enter here and move out of this. It should go inside the brain, process it, store it, whenever needed, immediately answer this question correctly. Now, next question. How does 2,3 BPG decreases the affinity of hemoglobin to oxygen? Very important concept based MCQ, hardcore concept, any idea? It is definitely going to bind to beta chain of hemoglobin. Very important guys. We have RBC, very important here is glycolysis. There is an important intermediate product of this glycolysis which is 2,3-BPG. It is going to bind to our adult hemoglobin HBA to important chain that is our beta chain of hemoglobin A. Because 2,3-BPG is binding with hemoglobin beta chain, now oxygen cannot bind. Oxygen, low affinity. That means oxygen will not bind here. This is going to happen. Oxygen release. Very, very, very important for tissues because oxygen is released. This is also called as unloading oxygen. 2,3 BPG binding with the beta chain. Now oxygen cannot bind low affinity. This oxygen will be released to the tissues unloading oxygen. What important shift is this, sir? Remember right shift of oxygen dissociation curve. So whenever there is a rise in levels of 2,3 BPG, unloading of oxygen will happen, oxygen release will happen, underline this R, right shift of ODC. On the other hand, fetal hemoglobin, we have gamma chains, 2,3 BPG don't bind to gamma chain. It binds only to the beta J. It is for this reason, this fetal hemoglobin has got a very high affinity for oxygen. Fetal hemoglobin, gamma chains, 2,3 BPG cannot bind to this gamma chain. Fetal hemoglobin has got a very high affinity for oxygen. On the other hand, adult hemoglobin, beta chain, wherever 2,3 BPG binds, adult hemoglobin, Low affinity for oxygen here, unloading of oxygen, oxygen release happens at the level of tissues. So 2,3 BPG is going to bind to the B for B beta chains. 2,3 BPG increase in levels will cause which shift? Right shift. 
fetal hemoglobin which shift left shift why 2 3 bpg cannot bind here fetal hemoglobin high affinity for oxygen very important next cardiac output can be calculated from it can be calculated using echocardiography thermodilution fixed principle so what is the answer here a c and d ventilation perfusion scan is very 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 important to find out pulmonary embolism the primary use of ventilation perfusion scan is in pulmonary embolism not for cardiac output so very important discussion the most important thing for estimating cardiac output is something called as fix principle remember guys what is this fix principle guys remember always remember guys amount of oxygen consumption by any organ for that matter it is the arterio venous oxygen difference how much is consumed some amount of oxygen comes some amount of oxygen goes out the difference is consumed so amount of oxygen consumption equals arterio venous oxygen difference what is bringing this oxygen blood is bringing this oxygen times blood flow amount of oxygen consumption equals arterio venous oxygen difference times blood flow it is this blood flow we can take as cardiac output so what is the formula for cardiac output it equals oxygen consumed by that organ divided by arterio venous oxygen difference what is this principle fix principle very important cardiac output can be calculated using fix principle you need the amount of oxygen consumption you need the arterio venous oxygen difference they will give you in question oxygen consumption this much arterio venous oxygen difference this much calculate cardiac output very simple cardiac output equals oxygen consumption divided by arterio venous oxygen difference now this is first method second we have something called as indicator dilution method a very important dye is used here for example remember evans blue dye this evans blue dye can be useful to calculate cardiac output what is the formula sir this amount of dye injected equals its concentration times volume this volume we can take as cardiac output it is the volume of blood in which the dye is going to be injected it assumes a concentration amount equals concentration times volume volume is the cardiac output so cardiac output equals amount of dye injected divided by concentration of the dye what dye is this evans blue dye at times use of this dyes use of this certain types of dyes can be toxic in few individuals so to avoid that we have one more important new method that is called thermo dilution remember guys in place of dye there is no dye here thermo we are going to use cold saline after injecting cold saline we have to measure the temperature changes and this temperature changes can be useful to find out cardiac output indicator dilution with the help of a dye thermo dilution is preferred with the help of a cold saline in place of dye then we have fourth remember echocardiography which is the most practical method which is the most commonly used method for estimating cardiac output in a clinical setting the most preferred the most practical the commonly used method for estimating cardiac output is echocardiography also remember only theoretical significance we have something called as ballisto cardiography also useful to estimate cardiac output but the descriptions the instrument useful for this are only in physiology museums presently no one is using this method only theoretical significance ballisto cardiography for estimating cardiac output so fix principle indicator dilution 
thermo dilution echocardiography the most commonly used one only theoretical significance ballistocardiography simple now next question match the following structures with their markers we have something called as the concept of marker enzymes mitochondria concerned with atp synthesis its inner membrane remember atp synthase so a endoplasmic reticulum the important marker enzyme is glucose 6 phosphatase post translational modification that is the function of golgi apparatus an important enzyme here galactosyl transferase peroxisomes very important enzyme catalase so for mitochondria inner membrane atp synthase endoplasmic reticulum glucose 6 phosphatase golgi body galactosyl transferase peroxisomes catalase also remember guys mitochondria if they ask you outer membrane the marker enzyme is monoamine oxidase mitochondria outer membrane monoamine oxidase then we have our very important lysosomes it is always about acid we have acid phosphatase very important then we have cell membrane remember our sodium potassium atpase is always present in the cell membrane sodium potassium atpase so also remember additionally the marker membranes for mitochondria outer membrane monoamine oxidase lysosomes is always about acid acid phosphatase cell membrane sodium potassium atpase physiology and biochemistry marker enzymes very very high yield area all right guys the next question the primary second messenger involved in the contraction of ciliary muscle during focusing on near object is this question is about the second messenger another very high yield chronic repeat topic second messenger system if you don't see any question on second messengers the world will come to an end <laughs> that is the importance of this topic second messenger it will be always there universal everywhere it will be there any exam second messengers the primary second messenger for contraction whenever you see contraction contraction is always with the help of calcium we call this ip3 dag calcium second messenger system so the answer for the question is ip3 dag calcium contraction a very important topic i told you remember guys it is from this table whole lot of mcqs came before second messengers we have three second messengers cyclic amp calcium cyclic gmp so concept wise if you remember it is very easy to answer when you need cyclic amp whenever there is a need for water reabsorption metabolism electrolyte secretion so the hormones concerned with this three important functions utilize cyclic amp water reabsorption we always need vasopressin v2 receptor action second messenger cyclic amp next metabolism glucose metabolism glycogenolysis epinephrine doing this glycogenolysis for this important action require cyclic amp and finally electrolyte secretion pancreatic juice that is rich in bicarbonate this secretion is considered to be the nature's antacid like our digen gelucil nature's antacid what is that secretion to neutralize acid the secretion pancreatic juice rich in bicarbonate so for this electrolyte secretion secretion use a cyclic amp hormones concerned with water reabsorption metabolism electrolyte secretion need cyclic amp then we have calcium very important for contraction very important for constriction for exocytosis you need calcium so for contraction remember vasopressin v1 receptor vasopressin vasopressin it is a vasoconstrictor constriction calcium very important contraction uterine contraction oxytocin the second messenger is calcium any contraction smooth muscle contraction particularly 
you need calcium and finally exocytosis moving of vesicles from inside to outside exocytosis thyrotrophin releasing hormone causing exocytosis of thyroid stimulating hormone tsh this t or h thyrotrophin releasing hormone is involved in exocytosis it needs calcium so for contraction constriction exocytosis you need calcium we call this as ip3 dag calcium system and finally we have cyclic gmp which is the opposite of calcium what is the meaning of opposite to calcium cyclic gmp for relaxation and dilation what is the meaning of this sir universal dilator vasodilator nitric oxide remember cyclic gmp relaxation particularly of mesangial cells natriuretic peptides you have a n p so for cyclic gmp remember n square there are two n's what are these two n hormones or agents for cyclic gmp nitric oxide natriuretic peptides for example a n p a very important table guys concept wise you remember easy to answer cyclic amp calcium cyclic gmp the question here which was asked about the contraction of ciliary muscle obviously you need calcium as second messenger system with this idea next question another favorite topic for examiners macula densa a very very important area this we have discussed numerous times before macula densa is made of specialized cells located at the junction of thick ascending limb loop of henle and dct the answer is c i'll show you a beautiful diagram conceptually you can learn a lot of points from this diagram what is the diagram sir look very carefully in a front segment where is this macula densa i'm circling and showing this is our macula densa md which is strategically located i must say strategically located where at the junction of ascending loop of henle and distal tibia exactly at the junction of thick ascending loop of henle and distal convoluted tubule exactly at the junction thick ascending loop of henle and distal tubule this macula densa is considered to be the sensor of gfr which means what whenever there is increase in gfr our macula densa will be activated it is going to release an important mediator which is called as adenosine this adenosine is going to cause constriction of afferent arteriole that's why i told you constriction of afferent arteriole strategically located macula densa this is our afferent arteriole it is going to cause constriction of afferent arteriole thereby decreases gfr what is the sequence guys increase in gfr macula densa will be activated adenosine will be released constriction of afferent arteriole decreases gfr there is a classical feedback operating here what is the name of this feedback sir tibilo glomerular feedback t g f from the tubules the feedback is sent to the glomerulus constriction of afferent arteriole decrease in gfr tibilo glomerulo feedback the cells concerned are macula densa sensors of gfr increase in gfr will be followed by a quick decrease in gfr the cells involved are macula densa they are strategically located at the junction of thick ascending loop of henle and distal convoluted tubule this is macula densa sensors of gfr very important question now guys look into this question this is actually the question which is asked for the very first time in inict exam very first time they ask this question so you need to understand lot of concept here because in future it can repeat what is this question sir second phase of salivary secretion involves lot of ions are shown here they are absorption reabsorption secretion their permutation combinations which one is secreted which one is reabsorbed sodium is here chloride is here potassium is here bicarbonate is here even though the options are very huge once you understand the concept the answer is simple for the time being remember the answer is a here there is active sodium absorption 
passive chloride absorption, active potassium secretion, active and passive secretion of bicarbonate. So there is active absorption of sodium, passive absorption of chloride, active potassium secretion, both active and passive secretion of bicarbonate. Let's understand the concept first. Look very carefully guys. A typical diagram, we have something called as acinus. Then the salivary duct. So we have acinar secretion first, then the ductal secretion. This acinar secretion is going to be considered as initial secretion or initial saliva. The acinar secretion is the initial saliva or initial secretion. Most important point, this initial secretion is always isotonic. Initial, primary, this initial saliva is always isotonic which is also called as our first stage. So if they ask about acinar secretion, it is about the first stage. This question is not about the first stage. This question is about the second stage. What is the second stage, sir? Remember, the ductal secretion is the second stage. This ductal secretion is going to be hypotonic. First stage, isotonic. The ductal secretion second stage is hypotonic. First look into this important acinar secretion. It is going to secrete sodium, potassium, chloride, bicarbonate. All their concentration exactly equal to plasma. Very important. This saliva now, this acinar secretion of saliva, initial saliva. If you look into the concentration of these ions in plasma, and saliva, it will be exactly same. That is why isotonic. First stage, isotonic secretion. Remember, sodium, potassium, chloride, bicarbonate, their levels are equal in plasma and saliva, which is going to get modified in the duct. What is going to happen in the duct, sir? This second stage, why it is hypotonic? Most important point. This ductal secretion second stage, remember guys, sodium, Chloride will be absorbed. Potassium bicarbonate will be secreted or excreted. Sodium and chloride are absorbed from the initial secretion. Potassium and bicarbonate are secreted or excreted. This later second stage is hypotonic. To understand this, a very important diagram. Look very carefully guys, a very very important diagram. This is considered to be our salivary duct, the second secretion, the question asked here. On this side, we will be having the blood vessel. That means blood vessel is the basolateral. This side is the lumen. This luminal side is considered to be the apical side. First, let's look into sodium and chloride absorption. Sodium and chloride absorption. This blood vessel side always has got an important channel protein. We know which is our sodium potassium ATPS, which is going to move sodium ions out and move potassium ions inside. What is the primary function of this pump here? It is keeping the intracellular sodium low. How? Because it is taking all the sodium ions out, it is take it is having the intracellular sodium low because all the sodium are moving into blood now. With the help of which channel protein? Our sodium potassium pump. The intracellular sodium is low now. Using this gradient, all the sodium ions now can come inside. Because the intracellular sodium is low, sodium is coming inside and this sodium will be moved out with the help of sodium potassium ATPS. It is why we call this 
as active sodium absorption. Sodium potassium pump is keeping the intracellular sodium low. Thereby sodium comes inside. This sodium will move into blood vessel absorption. Sodium is active. From where the sodium is coming? From the lumen. From the lumen, all the sodium is coming inside. That means there is less positive here. It is becoming more of negative. This negative is going to repel our chloride ions. You can easily understand. Sodium is coming inside. Lumen, more amount of positivity is taken inside. Thereby the lumen becomes more negative. This negativity is going to repel our chloride and this chloride ion moves passively into blood vessel. So far we have seen, remember, sodium is actively absorbed. Chloride is passively absorbed. This chloride mechanism we have seen. There is a negativity building up. This negativity is repelling our chloride ions. Chloride ions are passively moving into the cell then into the blood vessel. Two over. Now what about the next? Potassium. See because of sodium potassium ATPase, potassium is coming inside which is actively thrown out with the help of a potassium channel. This potassium will move out. That means remember potassium is undergoing secretion. It is an active process. Sodium potassium pump throws potassium ion inside. This potassium actively moves into the luminal side with the help of a channel. It is active. Potassium channel secretion active. Finally, we are left with bicarbonate. This bicarbonate is both active and passive. How sir? A very very important MCQ concept. Look very carefully. We have a very important channel protein which is called chloride bicarbonate exchanger. It is active because of, remember, chloride bicarbonate exchanger, which exchanges chloride ion for bicarbonate ion. So this bicarbonate secretion is active for the most part, is active for the most part. The predominant mechanism for chloride absorption is passive. The predominant mechanism for bicarbonate excretion or secretion is active. There is chloride bicarbonate exchanger where the bicarbonate is moving into lumen that is secretion. It is active. What is the passive mechanism for bicarbonate? Remember, another important channel protein in this blood vessel side there is a co-transporter, sodium bicarbonate co-transporter. Sodium is coming inside, bicarbonate is coming inside. This bicarbonate level is building up. This bicarbonate level is building up, very high concentration. So from high concentration, it moves to this luminal side. This is a passive process. That is passive secretion of bicarbonate ion. So we have clearly seen sodium actively absorbed, chloride passively absorbed, potassium actively secreted, bicarbonate ion both active and passive secretion. Sodium and chloride are absorbed, potassium and bicarbonate are secreted. Sodium is active, chloride is passive. Potassium is active, bicarbonate is both active and passive. The initial secretion as in R is isotonic. This important later secretion exclusively because water is accumulating here in saliva, water is not moving into the cell, water is accumulating, thereby it becomes hypotonic. Because these Ductal cells, their tight junctions are impermeable to water. Water once comes out, it cannot go back because it is impermeable. So water stays now into the lumen, making it hypotonic. So asinar, primary, isotonic. 
ductal secretion is hypotonic. In the duct, what is the answer now for this question? Look very carefully. Second phase means ductal. There is an active sodium absorption, passive chloride absorption. There is an active potassium secretion, both active and passive secretion for bicarbonate ions. So the answer is A. Asinor is the first stage. Ductal secretion is the second stage. Very important question. Now look into this question, guys. This question is about vomiting. The vomiting act. What are all the stages involved? Another new question you need to understand carefully. A woman has vomiting whenever she eats spicy food. Arrange the sequence of events during vomiting. There are a lot of important stages given here. You have to arrange in what order they appear. The answer for the question is C. We'll come back again after our discussion on vomiting and its mechanism. Now look very carefully guys. Whenever we talk about vomiting, three important factors needs to be considered here. First is neural. Second is humoral. And the third is muscular. They are all very important for this act of vomiting. Neural, humoral, muscular. What is this neural, sir? This is totally about the brain area. And what is that important brain area? Remember, area postrema has got an important part which is called as chemoreceptor trigger zone. Whenever this is triggered, this zone is activated or triggered, vomiting will happen. Next important area is nucleus tractus solitarius. So the brain areas important here are area postrema having this chemoreceptor trigger zone and nucleus tractus solitarius. Humoral means blood. So in blood, there are a lot of toxins, bacterial toxins, anything for that matter, which are known to cause vomiting. This toxins in the blood, which is going to activate our area post -hema. But we have a very important barrier we all know, blood-brain barrier. Particularly this area post -hema, there is no blood-brain barrier. That is why it is called as a, remember guys, circum ventricular organ. CVO, circum ventricular organ, it is outside blood brain barrier. There is no barrier here. That is why this area can sample the blood. Area postrema can sample the blood. Because there is no blood brain barrier here, it is outside the blood brain barrier circumventricular organ. So, the blood containing toxins can easily activate this area, area postrema, and the chemoreceptor trigger zone leading to vomiting. So, the neural areas we have seen, blood containing toxins can be easily sampled by our area postrema because there is no blood brain barrier. And finally, we have the muscular activity, and the muscles important here are remember, guys, diaphragm and abdominal muscles. Most important, look very carefully, the act of vomiting. First and foremost, there is nausea and salivation. There is increase in salivation. Why? Just now we have discussed this saliva is rich in bicarbonate. Because it is the gastric contents which we are going to emit out. This gastric region is highly rich in acid. It can damage. That is why for neutralization, saliva is increased. That is rich in bicarbonate. This bicarbonate rich saliva can neutralize the acidic gastric content. Simple. First, there is nausea. Salivation. That is rich in saliva rich in bicarbonate ion. Then we have deep inspiration against closed glottis. This is mainly needed to prevent aspiration into lung. Deep inspiration with closed glottis. This closed glottis is needed to prevent aspiration. Then exactly at the same time, remember there is something called as retroperistalsis happening in the small intestine, retro, in the opposite direction. 
So all the contents from the small intestine will move into stomach. Normally they move forward, stomach, small intestine, large intestine, but here it is retroperistalsis. The contents from small intestine are moving into the stomach to eject it out. Next, very, very, very important event. There is going to be a strong contraction of diaphragm and abdominal muscles. Diaphragm, abdominal muscles, strong contraction. This is going to squeeze our stomach. The squeezing of the stomach rises the pressure inside the stomach, which is going to open lower esophageal sphincter, upper esophageal sphincter opens, leading to eventually vomiting. So these are the important things, vomiting act. Nausea, salivation, first and foremost. Deep inspiration, close to glottis to prevent aspiration. In the same time, there is retroperistalsis of small intestinal contents into stomach. Now the stomach contains the things that needs to be vomited out. For this, what you need, the muscular, muscular thing. Here is the contraction of diaphragm and abdominal muscles. Diaphragm contraction, abdominal muscle contraction, your stomach is squeezed in between. The pressure, intragastric pressure rises, which opens the lower esophageal sphincter, upper esophageal sphincter, eventually the contents are vomited out. So with this idea, look into the question now. What is the answer for the question? B, D, A, C. Inspiration against the closed glottis we have seen. D, reverse peristalsis in small intestine. Then A, contraction of diaphragm and abdominal muscles. And finally, the intragastric pressure rises, which opens lower esophageal sphincter and upper esophageal sphincter, eventually leading to vomiting. Simple, this vomiting act, important concept we have discussed, it involves neural areas, toxins in the blood, and finally some muscular help to vomit the contents out. Important. Next question. The image shows membrane potential during action potential. The region marked as D to E is due to. Let's understand first. What is A here, sir? A is the resting membrane potential in a neuron. Normally, it is minus 70 millivolt. What is B here, sir? B is the threshold for firing action potential, also called as firing level. This threshold is minus 55 millivolt. RMP is minus 70. Threshold for action potential firing is minus 55. Then we have depolarization, which is because of, we all know, sodium ion influx. This depolarization is followed by repolarization. So between D to E, there is repolarization where potassium ions are moving out. It is efflux of potassium. So this image shows membrane potential during action potential. The region D to E is repolarization, which is because of efflux of potassium. So A is RMP, B is threshold. C is depolarization, D to E is repolarization due to potassium E flux. Simple. Next question, another high yield repeat area. Normal insensible water loss per day. Insensible water loss, that means it is not conscious. We don't know it is happening, but still it is happening. It is insensible we don't know but every day still it is it is not under our consciousness it is the non-conscious water loss insensible water loss remember guys the answer is 700 ml per day important discussion insensible water loss usually happens in skin and lung this skin means the water loss because of diffusion of water. Remember guys, it is usually around 350 ml per day. Insensible water loss, skin diffusion of water. This can be minimized. How? Cholesterol rich skin membrane. 
minimizes this loss. This insensible water loss through skin can be minimized because we all have cholesterol rich skin membrane. Any individuals affected by burns. Remember, individual physiology and surgery, burns, fire injury, burns, there is loss of this cholesterol in skin membrane leading eventually to lot of water loss because the protective mechanism is lost now. In a burn patient, the skin is denuded. This cholesterol rich skin membrane is lost. There is going to be tremendous amount of water loss. That is why they are more prone for dehydration in burns. So normally in all of us healthy individuals, skin insensible water loss is 350 ml per day, which can be usually minimized because of cholesterol rich skin membrane. On the other hand, lung. Remember, the environmental air is always dry. Whenever we inspire, this inspired air is humidified. Thereby, it is moistened. It becomes moist air. For this, you need to give water. The environmental air is dry. This dry, if you breathe, whenever you have common cold, if you breathe, you will always have the dryness in your respiratory passage. Normally, in all healthy individuals, this dry air is moistened or humidified. For humidification purpose, we need to give water. This water loss through lung is also an insensible water loss, usually around 350 ml per day. To convert the dry air to moist air, you need to give water. Respiratory passage epithelial cells gives this water. This water loss normally is around 350 ml per day. So, total insensible water loss, 350 plus 350, around 700 ml per day. So, insensible water loss, not under our consciousness, it is still happening through skin and lung, which is usually around 700 ml per day. So, the answer for the question, normal insensible water loss per day is 700 ml. And the next important question, Value of oncotic pressure of tissue. Tissue oncotic pressure. Very simple guys. The answer here is 5. Let's look into the discussion first. We have something called as Starling forces. It is going to happen across your capillaries and the interstitium. It is this interstitium which is considered to be the tissue interstitium. We have capillaries and the tissue interstitial space. We have something called as, remember guys, hydrostatic pressure which is denoted as P. We have something called as oncotic pressure which is denoted as Pi. Hydrostatic pressure and oncotic pressure are the stalling forces. Hydrostatic pressure is P, oncotic pressure is Pi. Now look into this capillaries. We have hydrostatic pressure in the capillaries. We have oncotic pressure in the capillaries. Now look into this tissue interstitium. We have hydrostatic pressure in the interstitium. We have oncotic pressure in the interstitium. It is this they are asking here for question. You need to understand which are all the forces which favor filtration, which are all the forces which is going to oppose filtration. Out of this four, remember guys, P, C and Pi I, they favor filtration. On the other hand, Pi, C and P, I, they are going to oppose our filtration. You have to calculate the net filtration pressure. It equals the forces that favor filtration minus those forces that oppose filtration. Minus forces favoring filtration minus opposing filtration. So it equals 
favoring filtration pc plus pi i minus opposing filtration pi c plus pi i there are stalling forces hydrostatic pressure and oncotic pressure some can favor filtration some can oppose filtration remember hydrostatic pressure is p oncotic pressure is pi they can be seen both at the level of capillaries and tissue interstitium they have asked particularly about this pi i that means it is going to be because of certain amount of proteins in the tissue few amount of proteins is found in tissue that is responsible for interstitial space oncotic pressure which can be anywhere between 3 to 8 mm of mercury the average we take 5 mm of mercury so this tissue oncotic pressure interstitial space oncotic pressure what is this pi i where is this it is going to favor filtration pi i the value is usually around 5 the range is 3 to 8 mm of mercury so the net filtration pressure is favoring filtration minus opposing filtration what they asked here in question oncotic pressure of tissue that means oncotic pressure is pi tissue is interstitium it equals 3 to 8 the average value 5 mm of mercury we take so what is the answer for this question 5 mm of mercury value of oncotic pressure of tissue tissue oncotic pressure is 5 mm of mercury very important question guys as i told you this inicet has got lot of questions came from repeat area majority of the questions came from repeat area one or two questions like salivary secretion and vomiting act very new questions we discussed in detail about the new questions so please to listen to this discussion carefully again just before your exam questions will surely repeat and with that note Good luck and best wishes guys all the very best thank you so much